Our scripture this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, and then we're going to start in chapter 9, verses 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you in prayer. We come to you in the strength of prayer because prayer is what moves mountains, Lord. And Lord, let us be a church full of prayer that's praying for the community and for our body and for the church as a whole. God, God, you know our hearts, you know our prayers. Help us show to our community through our prayer wall and through those strands of tape that we are a community that is based on prayer to you. God, help your presence be known in this community. And God, as you you reign over all of us, Lord, you are great and the Lord of all the earth. And help us to show the people that through that wall. And God, we pray, we pray over our body and over the people. And we pray for those who are celebrating and rejoicing in your goodness. And thank you for new life and for joined families and for all the joys that you bring to us god thank you for those but we also pray for our brothers and sisters who are hurting lord help us to show your grace and your mercy to walk with them with the broken hearted and the broken lord because we're all broken help us to show that and to be with them god and we pray for mike today as he talks about the costs of following you the costs to our lives, whether it be people, giving up people, money, time, God, and be with him and let him speak truth. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. If we didn't have a chance to greet this morning or if we haven't met, I'm Mike Moore. I'm lead pastor here. Glad you're here on this uh, wonderful rainy day. I do want to uh, remind you of the prayer tags, the prayer slips that you've got. I, one of the most precious things I saw last week, I don't get outside the building usually till after the fourth service, but to watch a family of four and the little kids tie them on the prayer chain, that was about the coolest thing ever. So I hope you'll write something and, and pray and continue to pray for that. I also want to uh, tell you at the end of my talk, there's going to be a little video that points you towards um, our annual financial campaign, which we're in the midst of. And I just want to say this so you hear this, two words about it. First, I want to say thank you. Um, Simon, uh, Kelsey, myself, um, Karen in the back, everything we receive in salary is at the end of your voluntary contributions you're giving to the Lord Jesus Christ. So thank you. Uh, thank you for that. We're, we're privileged to have that honor to serve you and, and those salaries so that we can work. Secondly, I want to say about our annual f- fund as well. Um, I say this clearly every year so you know. I've been involved with a lot of finance committees, including this one, and I've never seen a church budget in my 35 years of ministry that I thought was worth giving to. And I've seen a lot of church missions that are worth giving to. And I think Marion Methodist is one of them. And the way we execute that is through the the careful leadership of of, uh, Alex Mosman's finance committee and and, and that. So I'd encourage you to really, when you get that stuff, if you're a member of the church, you get that stuff this week, um, take it prayer in hand and work through that. And if you you don't get that stuff and you want to participate because uh, we don't try to pester you, um, we'd love to have you and and we'd encourage you. And we'll have the stuff for you next week if you want it. Lastly, before I go right to this talk, next week we're going to launch, I know it's not Thanksgiving, but we're going to launch the Christmas God Promises You next week because we want to have a full day where we can look at the carols we're going to sing during this Christmas time. And our band is going to lead us through eight carols next week. So if you hate Christmas music, tomorrow, next week is the day to miss. But if, if you have friends 
that love Christmas music, that would be the day to bring them to hear, uh, to, to praise the Lord with this band and go through those. And I promise you, we've already written our sermon and, uh, um, was it eight minutes max, maybe eight minutes max, right? Max. I'm, I'm looking at you. <laughs> They're looking at me. I'm looking at them. Max, we've, we've already written it. So it's going to be very brief. Um, and I hope you come. All right, let's go. It, you know, I couldn't have planned it this day to be like this. It was rainy and cold when I got here. Still, is that still going on out there? A little rain and a little cold. It was a really rainy, damp day, kind of like this some time ago. And I, and I heard the same basic sentence, not exact, but the same basic sentence from two women, two young women that I know very well. They both said this. I can't believe it, Pastor Mike. A hundred people said they were coming. Now, let me give you context. One of them had arranged this day where they rented like 10 of those bubble balls. You know what I'm talking about? Those big giant things that you slide into and then you play soccer, you bang off each other. They put together a whole spread of food and drinks and all that. They're just going to have a fun afternoon of that. But once they bought, once they rented them and once they started preparing the food, they couldn't undo it. And when the weather came, no one else did. And, and just her and her next door neighbors. And she said, I can't believe it. A hundred people said they were coming. Of course, I think a lot of those were Facebook and you know what you mean when you click that, right? Don't want to hurt your feelings. So yeah, I'll come. Same, same day. Another young young woman said to me, I can't believe a hundred people said they were coming. She'd picked a day like today. To have an outdoor wedding at one of our regional parks. And guess what? A hundred people showed up. She couldn't believe it. It was cold. It was rainy. I was cold. I was wet. The hair doesn't protect my head anymore, you know. All right. The, the, you know, so, so, so we were wet. But you know the difference was? Commitment. There were more people committed to her and her husband to come to that moment than were on the Facebook likes. To what are we committed? What are you committing to? Kelsey read just a few moments ago from Luke chapter 9. And this sentence kind of summarizes that. The cost of following Jesus is high. The cost of following Jesus is absolutely high. Jesus only requires one thing from us. All. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. But he asks for all. And so in this scripture that that Kelsey read a few minutes ago, there's three potential disciples there. They're not auditioning necessarily, but they're three people that have been following Jesus around. And one of them comes to Jesus and says, I'll go. Pick me, pick me, pick me. I'll I'll go. And Jesus, in, in the words of his day, and you can read it in scriptures, basically says, you need to understand what you're signing up for. You need to really look carefully at what you're signing up for, because what you're saying, signing up for is a big deal, because following me is going to lead to rejection, not glory, regardless of the age. It's going to lead to rejection, not glory. I, when we started working on this sermon a few weeks ago, I thought, I've got to be able to embody that somehow. How following Jesus in this generation leads to rejection, not glory. I wish I didn't have this story to tell you, but I do. During confirmation, our students get this little book, little spiral notebook, and they're to read 20 stories and fill out, answer a few questions for Pastor Mike. And if they do it all, all 20 stories, they get to go to Pizza Ranch for a party with me. (sighs) That's like a whole bunch of bad food choices, one right after another, right? But, But one of our beloved students had connections or study hall or whatever they call it in this generation where the students could do anything at their school. And so she had some free time. So she got her little Bible reading book out. She got her Bible out. She started doing one of the passages. And another student came up, took her Bible from her and flung it against the wall and said, you're an idiot if you read that stuff and believe any of that. That didn't happen someplace far away. That happened within a few blocks of where you're sitting Right now, now if that doesn't slay your spirit like it does mine, then maybe you're not as far in to Christ as I thought you were. But what we need to understand and hear over and over again is that Christians are not glorified in the meantime. This has happened to our students. This is happening to us. 
right now. So as we live in the meantime, we need to understand what Jesus asked us to sign up for. It's a hard thing. In a world that's based on what we deserve or what consumption is, we have to ask ourselves, are we ready to have less? Are we ready to have less than what we think we deserve? Because we all want to be part of a group that's, that's together and out there leading and all that sort of thing. Now, if you're new here, um, welcome. But you need to know, um, I bring football into every sermon. So here it is. <laughs> Gail Sayers, Hall of Famer from Chicago Bears had a sentence that he said all the time and come into plaques and T-shirts. It was simply the sentence, I am third. And what he meant by that when he talked about that with his friends is, God first, others second, me third. I, I am third. Th that is the call to Jesus Christ. That is to be a disciple, to say, I am third, because that rubs against our instincts of self-promotion and self-preservation in this generation and Jesus' generation and every other generation to say, I am third, Jesus you're most important. I'll follow you. Another disciple, one of the other potential disciples is, is near Jesus. And Jesus says, come, come on, come on. I pick you. I picked you. Come on, come on, come on. And he says, just a second, Lord. I can't go quite yet. I have a really good excuse. <laughs> Don't we all? I have a really good excuse, but I'll be along. I, I just can't come right now. And Jesus says, this first. Now. Now's your moment. A third one says to Jesus, I'll come, but, 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 but. And, and Jesus says, all means all. That's the thrust of his, of, of his, mo of, of what he says. All means all. And re there are no part-time disciples. You can't be a disciple just MW and F. You got to be a disciple all through the days, every single day. And, and I just want to pause here and ask you, how many sermons have you heard about this? How many lectures have you heard about not being just a Sunday only Christian or only <clears throat> a camp disciple? How, how many of these talks ha have you heard? I got to say, it's an argument that's as tired as the macaroni salad at the Golden, Golden Corral salad bar. It, it has been said so many times. I'm tired of saying it. You're tired of hearing it. So why do we continually repeat it? Because we need to hear it. You see, it's easy to say, I, Jesus, I, I'll follow you. I, I, I surrender all, all for you. I surrender. I, I'll follow you, Jesus. It's easy to say, but it's really, really hard to do. Really, really hard to do, to throw our whole selves in it. And, and, it's possible to do it. I know some. I've met some. Some of you are here. Right now, it's possible to become a full-time disciple with no excuses. And you have to come now, not later. We often say, I'll come, but, but Lord, <laughs> all the kids are coming over for Thanksgiving, so I can't get too involved right now because I've got a lot of cooking and cleaning. Lord, I'll come right now, but I'm just about ready to get a promotion. And until I get things squared away, Lord, I'll... I'll help out, but after the kids graduate high school and I'm an empty nester, I'll, I'll have more time. I'll, I'll come, but, 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 but later. And Jesus says, how much later? How much later are you going to come along? We rarely answer questions that ask for us to give all definitively. Look what uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote nearly 100 years ago now. If we would follow Jesus, we must take certain definite steps. I threw that nearly 100 years ago now because that was going on then, too. Don't ever look backwards and say, oh, it was easier to follow Jesus back then. Well, I don't know. They didn't have Internet sermons and stuff to listen to all the time or churches that they could comfortably sit in. So maybe, but I doubt it. All is hard. So last week, I kiddingly, I think at this service said, there's going to be a quiz on all this. And lo and behold, right there in your bulletin, there is one. Grab it, everybody. It says an evaluation. It's in smaller than Pastor Mike's size font, so I've got to get the goggles on. So it's this sheet says an evaluation, and, and here's why. I'm just going to read it to you. The Sharing Your Faith series concludes today. So if you're tired of it, no, oh, praise the Lord, it's over, right? Our leaders taught, Simon and I have taught this series, hoping we would grasp the meaning of the scriptures and their call to action. T.S. Eliot wrote, and I think this is critical, we had the experience, that's coming to church every Sunday, but missed the meaning. 
and approach to the meaning restores the experience in a different form. So I'm going to walk right through it from start to finish. Eight weeks ago, last week, September, we handed out 31 of these Bibles at the end of this service to our second grade class. Every single one of them, we prayed over it and we gave it to them, hoping, praying that they would read this thing and that it would become the center of their life and their faith experience. And we give them the Bible because it's the road to salvation and truth. That, that's why we give the Bible. That's why we read the Bible. That's why these worship services are fashioned around and, and fixed upon the Bible. And then twice during the series, yeah, it's been that long, we've had communion. So twice we've had the cup of salvation up here and we've left it up here throughout the, the whole series to remind you that, that salvation is for you and for all. So it's for you individually, distinctly and uniquely And it's for everybody that ever lived. This salvation comes for all. And then then we put this mirror up here. And I don't know if you noticed on this side, but it was only over there for a week. And they said, we don't like it over there. So I brought it over here. And I've noticed that really about the only people that love it is my 11 o'clock high school girls. Because they can sit in front of it. And and they like looking at it. You look good though, don't you, Alex? How do you look in there? But I put the mirror here because we spend so much time in our lives looking at the mirror that, that, that I put the mirror here to remind us to look beyond yourself, to look beyond yourself and see the opportunity in people that do not look, learn and own like you to receive Jesus Christ. And then a while back, I brought these two pictures, this one that looks like it's been shot a couple times with a 22 rifle. And that if I hold it up here, I can see Jesse and Marin right through there. It's kind of rotten, rusted out. To remind us what our lives are like on our own volition. To, to, to let you know that, that, that by ourselves, we kind of get blotched and blemished. We, if we just follow what we want to do, we kind of make a mess of, of what we're going to be. And God offers us a whole new life. And, and I put up this pristine and beautiful glass picture that Teresa got for her wedding. Mine too, I guess. To, to remind us that, that, that we get new fresh choice and it's without blot, blemish, or stain. And so the picture, the two pictures remind us that for us to share the choice of new life and why you took it. Because anyone that calls themselves Christ, you know, we, we believe in that sentence, you know, die once but be born twice. So if you've been born in Jesus Christ, tell people why, why you received the birth. And then... You know, hopefully you notice the door last day of it. So for those of you that have been trying to escape through it, it doesn't work. But we put the door up here to remind you of a couple of things. <clears throat> the door really reminds us that, first of all, when regards to the community of faith, it takes somebody to open it. And we need to, as Christians, uh, we are to offer an invitation and to be the welcome committee and guides all the while proclaiming this is the place for you. And, and, and I know I said this many times, but just remember this, you know, a door that's not open really just becomes a wall. And then uh, my most hated symbol, I brought the clock up here because now you people can see what time it is. I was fine looking at it when I'm talking back here. I've had a couple of people tell me I should just put different times on it, but. But it's important for us to understand that the time is now. And the time, the, 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 the reason that the time is, is the time is for using, not wasting. The only guaranteed we, time we have to witness Jesus is now. And then, today's vigil is not as good as I wanted it to be. But it is something that you understand. I brought this up, and this is the sentence I started with. The cost of following Jesus is great. I didn't bring a $1 bill up here, but I do want to remind you that Cost is a broad thing. I mean, obviously, if I put the money in front of stuff or put the money between you and other stuff, you can lose all that other stuff. Matter of fact, you can take a penny and hold it up and you can make the whole cross disappear. So it doesn't take much money to make our Christian goals disappear. But, but I brought this up as kind of a North American reminder that, that it really costs to be a disciple. And, and not just money, it costs us our time. You know, I mean, that's we all we obviously know that that which we love the most is what we invest our time, our talents, our treasures into. And you're called to do the same thing to Christ. When Christ says, love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, 
We can add all the rest of this stuff to and all your money and all your time and all your treasures and all your talents because all is completely inclusive. There's nothing outside of all. And here's the fear. Here's been my fear throughout this whole thing, throughout this whole eight week series, is that you will end up or we will end up like that old Billy Crystal skit on Saturday Night Live where they learn all the things they're supposed to do and how their lives can get better and promising to do this and that and looking down the future and say, I know I'm supposed to do this. But then at the end, we just say, ah, who am I kidding? That's just another thing I'm never going to do. And I don't believe that the share of witness to Christ is something that we can say that about. And Jesus makes clear the understanding that this is a lot. Because sometimes being a disciple is hard. And sometimes it's really hard. But those are the two choices. Sometimes it's hard. And sometimes it's really hard. But I would contend that everything worth doing is like that. There's always going to be objections against the community of faith. Because we follow a leader, Christ, who is never with his culture. Christ was never in the same team as his culture. When he showed up 2,000 years ago, he spoke against the sinful nature of humanity. He, he called the leaders of church and community into accountability. He, he demanded commitment from, from his followers and fidelity to his way. He didn't ask for just the people that kind of thought he was a good teacher to click like around the things he said. The truth of following Jesus, and this is unmistakable, undeniable, is that giving all is hard. It's always been hard. It gets harder the older we get. It's abrasive to the status quo, and you are going to stick out. And remember his commitment to all. The primary symbol of the Christian faith in this sanctuary and most everyone, everywhere else. Some of you have it on tattoos. Some of you got an earring. Some of you are wearing around your neck. But the primary symbol of our faith is a symbol of rejection. The cross of Jesus Christ is not a symbol of acceptance in his culture. It's like I said a few months ago, you know, when Jesus came to earth, they didn't invite him to tea. They put him on one. This is a symbol of rejection. This is this is what what happens to Christ. And we need to understand that when we follow the one who went to the cross, that rejection may come our way too. And this was a price he was willing to pay. Not for himself, but for you. Christians will never be with the culture and will always be in his community. See, we have to be in, but not of the culture. You and I have the opportunity to be part of the culture in which we live. We, we've got to live right in it. It's the only one we have a choice to live in, but we can't be of it. We can't, we can't aspire to all the values of the current culture that we're living. By the way, in any generation, I'm not just preaching for or against one specific generation, but we have to be for Christ in all the things we do. We have to, to allow ourselves to be countercultural. See, See, I grew up in an America that that many people believed was religious and it was not. And I think the biggest countercultural revolution that I've ever been involved in is being a disciple. And I think the biggest one you can ever be is the same one. Because Christians need to be complete rebels. Because if we live in the worldview with the morality and the sacrificial perspective of Jesus Christ, we are completely standing against the world in which we live. Rebels are always a minority. And they always need community. I was thrilled last Sunday afternoon. We had, I think, nine uh, new folks join our church. I think their names are listed uh, in your bulletin. And during that time, as we kind of go around the table certain different times uh, throughout our day, we listen to what folks are craving for and desirous of, of this community and why they want to be a, a part of it. And, it. and it was so exciting to listen to folks talk about how important it was to know that you guys were praying for them. And how inspiring it is for them to come to this sanctuary on a Sunday morning and just be in your presence because you inspire them. And how important it was to see the gifts be given in the service and to hear the witness, whether it's here or at the coffee table or in a Sunday school class or somewhere that you have to offer. Because the community of faith is exactly that. It needs to be a community. And so we get to the end of all this with, frankly, the appropriate number of minutes that I need. And it boils down to one sentence. Will you pay the cost of discipleship? You will get what he paid for. 
you will. The doctrine of the substitutionary atonement means that when Christ goes to the cross, he takes all of the worst of you so that he can give the best of him to you. He takes all your sins, all your rottenness, all your difficulties, takes that to the cross. In your place, he steps in, he substitutes himself and takes what you deserve to give you what he can bless you with. And those who follow Jesus will get his reward, but it's not always easy. See, you're part of a church. I've never started a church. I always have come into churches or ministries that are always already going on. This one's been here for 150 or so years before I got here. But I want to make sure you understand this because it's part of my DNA and it's part of, I pray, the DNA of this congregation. We don't want to be a church that has to look back to see the words of God, the work of God. We, we don't want to look backwards. We just have to look at our history. Of course, we need to look at the great things that God has done. We need to look at and see the vision, uh, the great vision that formed Marian Methodists to be the community that we're part of. We need to understand that the community of heaven and the community of Marian and its surrounding areas has both been broadened and made bigger by the work of Marian Methodists and all of our pretty preceding bodies and our forefathers and foremothers. And I unfortunately run into folks with some frequency that just want to sit and view that and gaze at that for a long, long time. There's been great things done here for God. And I want us to look at the great things that God will do here that are still to come, that are unknown, that are pointed at people <clears throat> that aren't even born yet, that, that, that haven't seen the world. I mean, look at the things that will be done here. Our look is always forward, not backwards. I love that part that Jesus says, no one that wants to plow a field looks backwards. You've got to go where you're going. You've got to look where you're going. More lives coming to Christ. More, more people being healed. More people being reached for Christ. More being filled here with the ministries. Way more people being added to those confirmation pictures than the one that sit out there in the hall right now. The mission of growing the community of faith is always in front of you. So now we come, we always come to the end of something. So now we come to the end of this Sharing Your Faith series. All this stuff will be gone next week. It's going to be replaced with some Christmas stuff. And here's the truth I want you to know. All my ministry in the Methodist Church, all 30-some years of it, I've been told that talking about evangelism is the wrong thing to do. But I'll tell you what, if you don't talk about evangelism, the church is destined to die. And hear this, you're all evangelistic. Because we're always happy to talk about the things we love. Oh my gosh, you want to have a conversation? Let's talk about the Hawkeyes or the Cyclones or the Panthers, right? We get a lot, or you people are in love with the weather, right? We're all evangelists for the weather. Oh, it's quite a day outside. Yeah, I know, I got here through the outside. All right? (laughs) <laughs> That's how I got here. But, but we're always willing to talk about the things we love. So why don't we talk about the things that love us the most and that we love the most, that gets us up out of bed, that brings us on a rainy day to meet with a group like this? Faith is meant to be lived out and to sh- be shared with folks. And it's meant to be shared by folks that are all in. Now, I'm going to take you to the end of this series through a little bit of an exercise, not another test. But a few months ago, we had an experience at Summer Games. And then a couple of weeks ago, at our knockout, one of our high school students shared how important that moment was for her. And she told how Dylan Fawcett led her to this moment and how it changed her life forever, which was okay, but actually I did it, but I'm going to give Dylan the credit. Sounded like me, but I'm like, okay, well, Dylan's more handsome and younger, so who wants to admit they follow some old guy, right? So, but, but I want to do this experience that we did at Summer Games. You can do with it what you want. But, but I really just want to take about three minutes of your time and just ask you to get settled, because I'm going to walk you through a little bit of a meditation that's guided, and then we'll move on to the next thing. So if you would, why don't you, whatever it takes, close your eyes, put you, it might be more effective that way. You know, get yourself settled for a little bit. Put your feet on the floor if that's what works better. But I just want to take you someplace in your mind's eye. So just imagine with your mind's eye, quiet. And just imagine with your mind's eye, you simply 
by yourself, standing, looking, but not randomly, because you can see something out in the distance. And as you continue to, to stare towards that place where it's nothing but light, you begin to see a figure. And that figure is unmistakably coming towards you. And you wonder what what's this is all about. And yet as that figure moves closer to you, you can see from the gait of his walk that it's somebody you know. It's a familiar figure. It's someone you've thought about a lot. And the closer they get, the more you can see the features of his body. It's Jesus. You know it is. And his face is looking at you and you're looking at him. And as he draws close to you, close like you're going to have a conversation, he just stops and eye to eye, face to face, there's Jesus looking at you and you at him. And his eyes seem to pierce yours and see deeply into your soul and yet you're unable to do anything but look back. And then he begins to move his face, and you know he's going to say something. In the millisecond before he says something, you wonder, what is Jesus going to say to me? Is he going to bless me for, for the person I am and because of his great love? Is he going to condemn me for all my sins? Is he going to call me out? What, what is he going to say? And so you wait. And as his eyes stare straight into yours, he just says two words, no sermon, No long talk. No real counsel. He simply says, follow me. And then he turns and walks away. And there you are again. You see the direction he went. You can still see him. What will you do? Choice is yours. He's not forcing you. Will you follow the one who has called you to follow? Will you leave where you're at and go with him? Or will you find your own way? Friends, that decision's yours. But we're on the move. And as for me, I'm going to follow him. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you take a look at this? My name is Mike Morgan. I'm the lead pastor at Marion Methodist. And with my family, we've been here 15 years and enjoyed every bit of that time. I'm thrilled to be asking you today to make a pledge to the ministry budget of Marion Methodist Church. Giving our pledge is one of Teresa and I's joy each and every year. It's the most theological document we write every year because in it we have to value where our treasure goes because as Jesus says, where your treasure is, there is your heart also. When Teresa and I fill out our pledge card each year, it's when we put our heart down on paper. We think carefully through what we might give. We joyfully and prayerfully consider what it is that we can give to God through the ministry of Marion First United Methodist Church. It's a privilege and pleasure to do that. And I hope that as you do that in your own home, that you consider the others that live with you. If you're in a family of one, of course, you can do all those things yourself. But if you're married or have uh, children, it's important to include them in the conversation and see what of yourself that you give to God through your ministry budget. It's also uh, available uh, not only in the paper that you're receiving today and will receive this week in the mail, but you can go to marionmethodist.org now and fill out a digital pledge card to join the new age in financing the church. So now that you have your pledge card, I really do pray that you'll take this as a matter of faith. Fill it out either this week, next week, or in one of the days to come. And return it into the offering plate or mailing it to the church so that the finance committee uh, might plan ahead for how we might support ministry at Marion Methodist this year. We really don't want to pester. And we will remind you from time to time, hoping to conclude this campaign by December 11th. 
Now, before we receive a single gift or a single pledge card for next year's budget, I'd like to take a moment and pray with you as we consecrate these gifts. The words will be on the screen. Will you pray with me? Lord, you are the source of every good gift. Everything we are and everything we have is your gift. And after having created us, you have given us the greatest of all gifts, your Son, Jesus Christ. Fill our minds with his truth and our hearts with his love, that in his spirit we may be bonded together into a community of faithful, caring people. In the name and spirit of Jesus Christ, we commit ourselves to be good stewards of the gifts entrusted to us. Bless and consecrate the offerings we give of our prayers, presence, gifts, witness, and service. Bless now the gifts of our financial resources that we shall pledge to you through the ministry of Marian Methods. Bless these gifts that they may be used to extend your kingdom here on earth through the making of disciples for Jesus Christ and the transformation of the world. Amen.